right, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For many of you, you're joining us for our very first time today, and so if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. It has been such a thrilling start to the school year. We've had over 20 broadcasts in September alone, everything from volcanologists to marine plastics researchers, divers, and more. It's been an incredible journey, and like always, you can catch all our programs on our YouTube channel. In fact, if you love this one and want to show your friends and family later, you can check this out in three weeks, three years, whenever you're keen to explore again with our topic du jour. Now, this is our first program to start off our second full week, and I am so thrilled to welcome back one of my all-time favorite educators. It's very rare that I run into someone as enthusiastic as me. In fact, it's basically never happened, which is why I was so pleased when I ran into Alex Nelson not too many years ago now and his amazing work at Club Rex. He is passionate about dinosaurs and that is the understatement of the day. I'm so excited to have a wide array of kids from all over North America today to hear about everything in the dinosaur world from Alex himself. Again, check out clubrex.org for all the amazing work that he does. But without further ado, to get you as excited as I am, I'm going to welcome in Alex. Thank you so much for joining us again, man. Welcome back. Hello, Jesse. Nice to see you. My friends, welcome to the virtual museum. Can you dig it? My name is Alex. I'm super happy to be joining you here today. As Jesse said, I work with Club Rex. Club Rex is a traveling dinosaur museum based here in Niagara, Ontario. But more and more, we find ourselves in the virtual world, offering programs online and uh, you know virtual clubs and that sort of thing. I'm really excited to be visiting with you guys today in your classrooms. As you can see, I brought all my dinosaur friends. These are my co-workers. Um, Let's get right off it. Um, my favorite dinosaur is T-Rex. I know everybody says T-Rex, but I absolutely love Tyrannosaurus Rex. I do have some questions for you, though. Can I go to a zoo and see a T-Rex? Put your answers in the chat. What do you think? Can I see T-Rexes at the zoo? We were in a zoo the other day. I saw bison. I saw some camels. I don't. I didn't see any T-Rexes. I don't know. What do we think, kids? YouTubers, feel free to chime in as well. I think <laughs> yes. I'm going to spoil it for you, my friends. N yes. yes. Oh. <laughs> okay, so my friends in Newfoundland, I would love to visit the zoo that you're going to. That has Me too, <laughs> right down the road. Oh. Oh, you're keeping secrets, my friend. Here's the thing. There are no T-Rexes at the zoos. I can't go out to the lake and swim in the water and have a Mosasaurus swim by me. I can't go out into the woods, take a picnic lunch, and be harassed by pterodactyls. There are no more dinosaurs. Believe me. Oh, friends, I really want a pet velociraptor. I really, really, really want a pet velociraptor. I'll walk it every single day. I'll pick up after it. I'll brush it. I'll feed it. Maybe a cat or two. Um, I really want a pet velociraptor, but I cannot have a pet velociraptor. The reason, obviously, for this is extinction. Dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago. Take, give or take, 500,000 years or so. And what happened on that very, very, very last day of the dinosaurs is an asteroid. An asteroid the size of a mountain. An asteroid so very big that it changed the planet we're standing on today. This asteroid crashed right onto a sunny, sandy beach in the Gulf of Mexico. And when that asteroid landed, all of the uh, sand underneath it superheated, went flying up into the sky. Volcanoes exploded due to the destruction of the Earth's core uh, crust. And volcanoes started exploding all over the planet at the same time, releasing more gas and dust and ash into the atmosphere. The planet got really, really cold. The sky got dark. The middle of the day looked like the middle of night. Plants started to wither and die. Triceratops are very big dinosaurs, and Triceratops need an awful lot of food every single day to survive. A T-Rex is an awfully big dinosaur, and a T-Rex needs an awful, uh, an awful amount of meat every single day just to survive. So when the world changed way too quick for dinosaurs to keep up with those changes, dinosaurs went extinct. Here's one thing, though. We can't get too upset because not every single dinosaur did go extinct. We still kind of have dinosaurs on planet Earth. We call them avian dinosaurs today. You can probably look out your window and see an avian dinosaur. Maybe if you eat meat, you might have an avian dinosaur for supper. Um, here's an impression of an avian dinosaur. It sounds just like this. <gasps> ah, 
Behold the mighty chicken, a living dinosaur. There's a paleontologist in Montreal. He spends his days putting fake tails on chickens, putting those chickens on treadmills, and videotaping them running in slow motion. What you notice is when you put a fake tail on a chicken, it kind of adopts a different stature. It doesn't stand up like a chicken. It leans forward like a tyrannosaur. And as you look at those footprints left behind, we can learn more about how T-Rexes breathe and run. By studying things like eagles and owls, we can learn about how how um, raptors would hunt. Um, but what is cooler, a T-Rex or a chicken? I'm not going to uh, wait for an answer for this one because the answer is obviously a T-Rex. In order to learn about T-Rexes, in order to learn about any dinosaur that went extinct millions of years ago, we need to find fossils. Now, here's the thing about fossils. When we talk about fossils, people say dinosaur bones. Fossils are different than bones. Fossils have undergone a process called fossilization, which is very convenient. And when things fossilize, everything that is organic about that bone, everything that is calcium or things like that gets stripped away and get replaced with minerals. So when we find a fossil, we're not finding an actual bone. We are finding, well, nature's memory of that bone or of that animal. So when we find a fossil, it does not come with a label telling me what that fossil is. When I find a fossil, it doesn't come with an instruction booklet showing me how to put that dinosaur back together, um, unless you get it at Ikea. When I find a fossil, my friends, I need to be a dinosaur detective. I need to use my eyes to come up with ideas. I need to use my imagination to help me understand just a little bit more. This is why I think kids are so much better than adults at dinosaurs. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a bunch of different fossils. If you think you know, what these fossils are, I would love for you to put an answer over in the chat. Over in the chat. Sorry, it's a new camera. I'm getting used with opposite things. Here's my first fossil. Check it out. This fossil is from South America. Let me back up a little bit. This fossil is about mm, 70 million years old. Now, here's the thing. When we're finding fossils, knowing where they came from and knowing how old they are, are extremely part, important parts of clues. If we don't have this information, it can be extremely tricky to associate a fossil with a certain dinosaur. But looking at this fossil, well, there we go. Does anybody have any idea what this fossil could be? I'll turn it around for you. Any ideas at all? Mm, sort of looks like a, be a claw, maybe. Oh, it could be a claw. Yeah. It's yeah. not. Oh, what do we have here? Steven's Crossing. crossing. That's two. Nailed it. Yes, it's a tooth. My friends, this is a dinosaur's tooth from a very, very big dinosaur called Giganotosaurus. Giganotosaurus lived in South America. Giganotosaurus has an extremely sharp and pointy tooth. Now, here's the thing. When I find a sharp tooth from a dinosaur, I know what that dinosaur ate. That dinosaur was a meat eater. When we have sharp and pointy teeth, we do not chew with those tooth. Instead, we use these teeth to catch something that running away from me. Last time I checked, potatoes don't run away from you. You grab them, you mash them, you put gravy on them. I do not need a tooth like this to eat plants. Giganotosaurus was almost the same size in terms of height and length as Tyrannosaurus rex. And this tooth really, really did help Giganotosaurus catch its prey. Here's another fossil for you. Um, this one might be a little bit close to what Jesse was talking about. Any idea what this fossil could be? Check it out. It's got a strong curve to it. It's got an articulating surface right there, which means it can move just like that, up and down. Does anybody think? Yeah. They're, they're doing so great. They're, they're killing it, Alex. These guys are fantastic. I'm going to go away, and you guys can look at the dinosaurs. You got Stevensville Crossing. I'm so impressed. Dinosaur claws. This is the claw from an Allosaurus. Allosaurus is right here behind me on my shelf. Allosaurus is one of the largest meat eaters we had in North America during the Jurassic time period. An absolute crazy dinosaur with sharp claws, feet that look like springs, 
sharp, gnashing teeth. Allosaurus is fantastic. And the one thing we need to remember when we find a dinosaur claw, what we are finding is the bone that grows the claw. Claws themselves are just like your claws or your fingernails. They're made up out of keratin and keratin does not turn into a fossil. So this claw here, when this dinosaur was alive, would have been that much longer and razor sharp like a uh, sharpened pencil at the tip. I want to show you my very favorite claw though. This claw is the largest claw that's ever been found in the fossil record and it belongs to a dinosaur called Therizinosaurus. This claw is huge and remember it would have been way longer when this dinosaur was alive. Therizinosaurus does not have a sharp point at the end of its claw. Let's, ooh, there we go, zoom in there. It's not sharp at the tip, instead it's rounded. The sharp part is right underneath here. Therizinosaurus is a plant-eating dinosaur. Therizinosaurus could use its claws to pull down trees, to scrape and cut, um, to use its claws as a defensive mechanism uh, in case something is trying to attack it. This is my very favorite claw because whenever my back is itchy, I can reach just about anywhere. It's a fantastic back scratcher. Um, so, Therizinosaurus claws show us how different kinds of animals can use their claws for different reasons. And this is an incredible claw. I do want to touch on one thing, though. We've got some really interesting news, and it has to do with this kind of fossil. This isn't a bone. This isn't a claw. Check this out. I'm going to see if I can zoom in a little bit. i got a focus thing on here, and I don't know if it... Wow, look at that. It's focusing. Check out this fossil. This fossil is from Alberta, and this summer we made some very important discoveries as it pertains to this kind of fossil. Any idea what this thing could be? Ooh. Ooh. Really, really, in, really ineffective claw, just, you know, slapping. Uh -huh. um, a paw? That's a wonderful guess. It's okay. not a paw, although I do have a dinosaur's footprint right here <clears throat> excuse me and this dinosaur's footprint actually belongs to this same fossil it's from the same kind of animal check it out we've got all of these little patterns all of these little circles are all forming together like this all grouping together with creases oh my goodness <laughs> dinosaur skin nailed it for low split though guys you guys are really good out there. And here's the thing. Dinosaur skin is one of the most important fossils that we can find. Dinosaur skin shows us what dinosaurs actually looked like. We're guessing an awful lot when it comes to the colors of dinosaurs, what they look like. These are scales that we see on this dinosaur skin. And this skin does belong to a dinosaur called a duckbill dinosaur or a hadrosaur. And if you're laughing, stop laughing. If you're picturing a giant duck, that's just a big duck. Duckbill dinosaurs are not large quacking animals. Duckbill dinosaurs don't walk around going, quack, quack, quack. Instead, dinosaurs like duckbills walk around all day going honk, honk, honk. Here's a perfect example of a duckbill dinosaur. So this is a dinosaur called Corythosaurus. There we go. Corythosaurus is a duckbill dinosaur from North America, so the United States and um, parts of Canada. And when we look at a fossil like this, first of all, what we can see is that this head is being squashed a little bit. If we look on the far side, we can see that there's an awful lot of damage to this side of the skull. And that's just something that happens when things fossilize. It's under so much pressure and it's under so much weight from the things crushing down, so much time in the dirt that we often get a lot of damage. If we look at this duckbill dinosaur, the first thing we can see is this hole right there. That's where its eye goes. Um, we have this jaw down here. It's a very heavy, powerful jaw, which shows us that these kinds of dinosaurs are constantly chewing their food, kind of like a Cretaceous cra uh, cow. The teeth right down here are flat and square. These teeth are used for chewing, and that kind of goes with the heavy, heavy, powerful jaw. So these dinosaurs are plant-eating dinosaurs. Now, it does have a ducky mouth. Oh, my goodness, new camera. It does have a ducky mouth, but this isn't the part that makes the quacking 
check out on top of his head. Right above this dinosaur's eye is its crest. And every single duck-billed dinosaur has a different shaped crest. One of the more popular ones is called Parasaurolophus. It's got like a big snorkel or crest sticking out the back of its head. Corythosaurus has its crest right in front of its eye. This helps this dinosaur make a different sound than any other duck-billed dinosaur. It's a great way to call your kids back. Honk! Get back over here, kids. Get out of the pool. It's a great way in case a T-Rex is getting too close to warn the rest of the animals. Honk! Honk! Here comes a T-Rex. These animals are really social, communal animals. And the discovery we made this summer, well, our friends at the Royal Terrell Museum out in Alberta made a fantastic discovery. And it it has to do with dinosaur skin and duck-billed dinosaurs. What they did after doing a little bit of work on skin just like this is they discovered that certain species of duck-billed dinosaurs had zebra stripes on them, stripes that would go from the sky down to the ground, and they looked similar to zebras. This gives paleontologists a different kind of idea about these duck-billed dinosaurs. We already know that these animals were living in large groups, but we didn't know if they were living in forests or if they were living on out in the fields or if they were living on plains. The fact that they have stripes makes us think that maybe they were living like zebras. Zebras today live out in open fields in the Serengeti. They stand together in a large group, and those stripes help confuse predators. Lions can't tell the difference between one zebra and another zebra because it just looks like a whole group of stripes. Maybe duckbill dinosaurs were exactly the same. Maybe duckbill dinosaurs were using the stripes on their skin as a way to confuse their predators. And T Rex is one of the largest predators for this dinosaur. So, T Rex. I love Tyrannosaurus rex. Oh, much. Just ask Jesse. Uh, Jesse will tell you, I can't stop talking about T-Rex. Now, T-Rex isn't necessarily our longest meat eater. T-Rex isn't necessarily our tallest meat eater. But T-Rex is our heaviest, strongest, and most powerful meat eater. Right now, the largest T-Rex that has ever been discovered is a dinosaur that has been nicknamed Scotty. Scotty was found in Saskatchewan about a decade ago, and Scotty is over 10.2 tons, making it the largest land carnivore that has ever existed on planet Earth uh, that we found so far. Here's the most amazing thing about T-Rexes. T-Rex teeth are absolutely incredible. This is a T-Rex tooth, and what we'll notice about a T-Rex tooth is it is thick, it is long, and it is extremely wide from both angles. Not only that, it's not super sharp at the tip. Giganotosaurus has a very sharp tooth. T-Rex, not necessarily. A T-Rex doesn't really want blades for teeth. They want spikes. When a T-Rex bites, it flattens its head because it bites so very hard. The strongest bite force of any meat-eating dinosaur that has ever been discovered. But the one thing we have discovered about T-Rex, and it has to do with how big they got, is once you become a grown-up T-Rex, there's one thing you're not doing a whole lot of anymore, and that's running. When you get to that giant size, your ankles are sore, your back is sore, you don't feel like running. But you know what? Because T-Rex is so big and because their heads are so gigantic, T-Rex has a very big advantage over other meat-eating dinosaurs. It has to do with their brains. Tyrannosaurus rex has an absolutely massive brain. We don't give dinosaurs an awful lot of credit for being smart. Well, we can point that towards Mr. Stegosaurus over here. Uh, they say Stegosaurus' brain is about the size of a peanut. That's not nice. It's about the size of a hot dog. So it's not a giant brain. T-Rex, however, has the same body to brain ratio as a chimpanzee, making it a smart thinking dinosaur. When they got to their full size, a T-Rex isn't running or chasing dinosaurs anymore, but a T-Rex doesn't need to. T-Rexes are smart enough to live with the family. When you're in a group of T-Rexes, and we call a group of T-Rexes a terror of Tyrannosaurus, when you're in a terror of Tyrannosaurus, you live with your brothers, you live with your sisters, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your parents, and your grandparents. And you guys all work together to hunt. When you are a T-Rex kid, there's one thing you can do that your grown-ups cannot, and that is run.
T-Rex kids can run faster than their grown-ups. And that kind of makes sense. Can you guys run faster than your grown-ups? I'm pretty sure you can. When you get older, you get tired, you have less energy, your ankles hurt, your back hurts, as I said. Um, so you're not running as much. When you're a T-Rex or a kid, and when you're a human kid, you have endless energy. I don't know where you get it from. Um, you can run really, really fast. You're lighter. You have more uh, ability to get further away. So when you're a T-Rex kid, holy moly, you have a chore to do. And I'm sure you guys have an awful lot of chores. Um, out there in, uh, in computer land, right? Uh, people making their beds, people helping making their lunch, uh, mowing the lawn, walking the dog, a whole lot of chores that you can do. If you're a T-Rex kid, though, you have a very different kind of job. Your job is to chase horned dinosaurs. If I was a T-Rex dad, with my little tiny arms, and you were my T-Rex kids, this is what I would say. I'd get up in the morning, I'd stretch my little tiny arms, stretch up my back, oh, it's so sore. And I would say, okay, guys, Here's what we're going to do. Mom, dad, uncle, aunt, grandparents, we're going to stay back in the forest here. You guys are going to go out into that field because you see those triceratops out there? You can see them. They're very loud. They're very noisy. They're standing in a big group. Some of them are grazing. Some of them are bashing their horns against each other, trying to figure out who the strong guy is. You guys are going to chase them. You're going to chase them and you're going to show your teeth. You're going to wave your little tiny arms. You guys are going to be scary. I want you to scare the pants off of those dinosaurs. Dinosaurs don't wear pants. I want you to scare the horns off of those dinosaurs. So that's what you do. You and your brothers and sisters and cousins start running really, really quickly. You're showing your teeth, you're hissing, you're snarling, and those triceratops see you coming and they panic. They start to run in the opposite direction. They're stumbling over each other and this just drives you forward. As a group, you guys chase those triceratops and then you start to notice one or two of them fall behind. Maybe they didn't have a complete breakfast. Maybe their ankles and backs hurt also. Whatever reason, that's who you guys focus on. You chase that dinosaur around until it's exhausted and then you chase it back to the forest because inside the forest the grown-ups are waiting dad's there he's got his barbecue lit he's got his clackers clack 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 and as soon as that triceratops burst through the fields that's where the grown-ups are able to use their strength in their jaws to strengthen their feet to stomp and attack and help bring down that prey animal so t-rexes really are good at working in groups and i've got to show you oh my friends oh, I just got a new T-Rex. His name's Brett. He's a baby. This is Brett the baby T-Rex. And what we'll notice about baby T-Rexes is that just like their grown-ups, they have very large holes for their eyes. They have very good senses of smell. We can tell from this hole here. And they also have all of these amazingly sharp teeth. Now, Brett the baby T-Rex is nothing in terms of size compared to obviously its parents. As a matter of fact, the skull is about the same size as a grown-up T-Rex's tooth. But having baby T-Rexes on your team is a really great way to get into action. And that's something we need to remember. Not all dinosaurs were giants. Check out this guy. This is a Microraptor. I need to focus. No, I'll just hold him back here. Microraptor looks just like this. Microraptor has two sets of wings that is related to Velociraptor and Deinonychus and, oh, not Optimus Prime though. Um, and Utah Raptor and all of our other amazing dinosaurs um, that are considered to be raptors, but Microraptor can fly. Jumping out of trees, using its wings to glide. Microraptor, not big, but man, he's cute. Pretty cool, right? So all of these different dinosaurs, that's one thing we need to remember, is that not all dinosaurs were giants. And the fact that some of them were smaller actually helped them survive when that asteroid uh, landed. And of course, let's not discount the Triceratops' ability to defend themselves. When you are a herbivore, you are given some pretty cool weapons. My favorite dinosaur for fighting is this guy right here. This is an Ankylosaurus. Um, if you watch Camp Cretaceous, you know him as Bumpy. This here is Frank, Frank the Ankylosaurus. Um, he likes to be called Franklosaurus, so we call him Franklosaurus. He's happy that way. Franklosaurus is an amazing dinosaur. And right here, we can see their noses. Pick, 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 
click, click. The eyes are at the sides of their heads as opposed to in the front looking forward. This gives this dinosaur a great ability to scan the area around it. When we look on top of its head, we can see dinosaur armor. So Ankylosaurus has these little tiny pieces of bone that are fused right to the top of its head, continue over its neck, shoulders, and back, making him look like a giant turtle. And one of my favorite things about Ankylosaurus, oh, watch that tooth, watch that claw, is of course ugh, this thing. This, oh my goodness. This is the weapon from the back of an Ankylosaurus. This is a club tail. This club can swing back and forth. And if you get hit with a club like this, it is really going to ruin your day. This is one of the perfect weapons for fighting off something like a T-Rex. Even if you've got a group of T-Rex kids running at you, Getting as close to the ground as possible and swinging this tail back and forth is a fantastic way to defend yourself. So even though Tyrannosaurus Rex, uh, Allosaurus, and all these other meat eaters are wonderful at hunting, their food is not an easy prey. I always feel bad for T-Rexes. Imagine opening up your lunchbox at lunch and your sandwich tries to attack you. That's what it's like to be a T-Rex. It's crazy, crazy stuff. Um, Jesse, my friend, would you like to ask some questions? I <laughs> the sandwich attacking is still in my head very much. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, Miss Hurdy's class, our K1 crew, Miss Flynn's class. We're gonna take questions live if we can. So if you want to unmute your microphones, I'm gonna come to our crew. You are <laughs> there. Um I wanna I, in fact I'll go to Miss Flynn's class first. They've already got their mic unmuted, so we'll start with them. Stephenville Crossing. Hey folks, I'll get a second device turned off and then we'll <laughs> we'll take that question. Oh dear. Miss Hurley's class, I'm coming to you in just a second. Miss Flynn, let's see. I'll try again. Can you hear us? Yes, perfect. All right. Does anybody have a question? Yeah. What is your question? What do you want to know? Ask a question. Does anybody have a question? No questions. No, you guys are really good at knowing dinosaurs. I just have to put that out there. Uh, That's you, you're And Stevensville Crossing. Where are my dinosaur experts? Yeah, there you go. We got a pile of dinosaurs in the in the center of the. Yeah, I got dinosaurs. Yeah, they were playing with the, with the broadcast. It was amazing. You know what, my friends? I have an awful lot of toys for somebody my age. Most of them are dinosaurs, but a lot of them are trans. Anybody have any questions about dinosaurs? I know you're all dying to wave. Right here, over here, wave over wave. here. We can wave, and then if you have questions, you can come back. And Miss Flynn can ask questions on behalf of the class too, and we're back. But hi, so nice to have you guys. And you can well, think of some questions. Miss well, Flynn, the only thing that they're asking about is the only thing that's behind you that's not a dinosaur. Yes, Optimus, oh. Optimus Prime. Like, oh. <laughs> right? Yes, is that Optimus Prime? Yes, oh, is that I'm a transformer? Off my desk and Optimus Prime. He looks so good up there. Usually uh, Yoda's up there. Um, but, you know, I always like to say be an Optimus Prime, not a Negatron, right? Is it really? Uh, I thought, my friends, you were talking about Tinkles the Terrible because I do have something on my shelf up here other than a Cybertronian that isn't a dinosaur, and that is Tinkles. So Tinkles is right here. Oh, Tinkles look. the Terrible is not a dinosaur. Meow. Oh, that's not Tinkles a dinosaur. the Terrible is not a walrus. Meow. See, Tinkles the Terrible is not a vampire. Meow. And he guesses oh, that you Tinkles the Terrible. Yes, it is a kitty cat. I love cats. This here is a saber-toothed cat or a smilodon. This is an ice yeah. age animal. The eyes go right there, right there. Once again, pick, 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 pick there. Flick, 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 flick. What I love about these animals is the size of these um, hunting teeth. And in order to use these teeth, oh, he's going to bite me. Out of all the dinosaurs I have, this is the only one that still bites. In order to use those teeth, Tinkles needs to open his mouth incredibly wide so tinkles can open its mouth about that wide in order to use those teeth for hunting mm. what a naughty kitty don't get on the wrong size of this side of this kitty so yes not a dinosaur good spotting also not a dinosaur 
<laughs> Way to go, Miss Flynn's group. Um, Miss Ernie's class, we're gonna have you guys. I, you had your mic unmuted. Yes, let's come on in and share away. Hi, six sevens. Sixes and sevens. Awesome guys. How are you today? We're good, thank you. Julia is here with a question for you. Hi, Julia. Hi. Okay. Um, were dinosaurs able to communicate with one another? Ooh. Oh, big time. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, you know, dinosaurs we have learned over the last 20 years are extremely social animals. Um, we find um, nesting sites of duckbill dinosaurs out in Alberta. We find, um, you know, like the ability to hunt in packs with raptors and rexes. Oh my. So yes, they were definitely able to communicate with one another. Now they could communicate in a series of different ways. Obviously the most, um, the, the easiest way to communicate would be through body language, right? If, if you get defensive, then you get defensive. Um, uh, then making sounds is another wonderful way for them to communicate and with the, the the ability for dinosaurs to make sounds is pretty well founded right well we we believe that things like velociraptor would have chirped would have sound awfully uh, awful like a bird maybe talking one back and forth burp, 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 kind of thing i can hear the blue jays at my window as we're talking now um uh, I, I think they're looking for girlfriends, but it's the same kind of idea, right? We can also have things like visual communication. So dinosaurs are able to show off different displays, not just body language. Um, think about like the back of the head of a triceratops. Um, triceratops is the only ceratops you know, out of hundreds of different species that has a solid frill on the back of its head behind its brain and behind its horns um so originally when we saw a triceratops we were thinking well maybe they're using that as a way to defend the backs of their necks but if we look at an animal like this pentaceratops and this is one of my toys my kindergarten friends in stevensville check this guy out um this crest is awfully large right and it's also hollow there's two giant holes in there to help keep it nice and light so we're thinking that the crest here would have been able to show different communication too. There's dinosaurs that are able to color flush. Um, this is Elvis, the Cryolophosaurus. Uh uh, say hello, my friend. Hello, my friend. So Elvis has this awesome haircut on top of his head. This is not a haircut. It's actually a crest of bone. And the grooves that we can see, let me turn it towards the light. You can see these grooves that are in the front of it. And those grooves uh, in between those um, pieces of bone would be blood vessels. So the whole idea is that this dinosaur could change the color of its head, right? So if Cryolophosaurus is a, um, a mature dinosaur and somebody is trying to maybe hunt in his territory, he can show off bright colors and make loud noises. And this would be a good way for him to scare off a potential um, com uh, competitor for his hunting grounds, right? Showing off those bright colors, saying something like, move on, man, get away, oh, all right? Uh, or if he's looking for a girlfriend, right? Showing off super bright colors. Um, running up to a group of girls and saying something like, hubba, 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 I'm not sure. But uh, dinosaurs can communicate in a variety of different ways. By the way, we just discovered that Ankylosaurus, even though it is not related to birds, would make chirping sounds like a bird. So your guess is as good as mine, my friends. But communication is definitely something that's established with dinosaurs. So we've got one other question, which is a neat little parallel to this. Uh, and then time flies and you're having fun. So we'll wrap up not long after that. But you've talked about color. How do we possibly know color? Don't we just have, I mean, you, you show this fossilized skin. Can, it seems outlandish that we can get something from that is our question from our class on email. How do we know? Well, you know, it, this is not above my pay grade, but the scientists are able to use different kinds of tools to get melanoma out of the skin. In some cases, on most of the cases, we are just guessing. If you want to color a T-Rex with tiger stripes, go crazy. It's not based in science, but there's nothing out there saying that they didn't have tiger stripes. Plus, it looks really, really cool. I will say this. Nature likes certain designs. We've already talked about zebra stripes on duckbill dinosaurs. A um, microraptor, oh, I gotta move over here. Microraptor we know was black black iridescent feathers, just like a crow, just like a raven. This little animal, I'm so happy I get to show up all my new friends. This little animal is something called a Cetacosaurus. So Cetacosaurus is a very early ceratopsian. Cetacosaurus, when they discovered it, um, well, one of the uh, specimens that they discovered, they discovered that Cetacosaurus um, 
had cheetah spots all over its body. So it was yellow with these brown spots over its hindquarters and over its back and over its stomach. Cetacosaurus is another dinosaur that we know the color of. Preservation of soft tissue is an extremely rare thing, but when it happens and when we're able to get colors, it is a very exciting thing to find. But as I said, cheetah spots, right? Zebra stripes, black like a crow. Oop. Nature sees certain things and it works so well for some kinds of animals that millions of years down the road, we see them again in other kinds of animals. That's called convergence, convergent evolution, which means that, you know, it works so well the first time, why not try it again? So we're only gonna learn more and more as it comes to uh, the colors of dinosaurs, but our paleontologists today are doing an amazing job. And you know what's really exciting is that we've got more people digging up dinosaurs today than the entire history of paleontology. So all of the new news is gonna be coming in fast and furious, my friends. Um, it, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful time to be obsessed with dinosaurs because there's always something new to learn. And just like any other science, it's a constantly growing and constantly evolving thing. So we have to keep our eyes open. We have to keep our ears open. And we need to make sure that we don't get stuck in what we think of dinosaurs. You won't believe how many kids um, have seen Jurassic Park and then we get fights over Velociraptors. Not physical fights, but arguments. Hmm. Right Four-year-olds. What can I say? <laughs> Alex, this has been such an enthusiastic, amazing program as always. Uh, again, thank you for bringing so much of the cutting edge of dinosaur research to us every single time for audience of all ages. It's been such a thrill. Uh, I do encourage all our classes, clubrex.org if you want to find out even more. Uh, now, Miss Hurley, Miss Flynn, our K1 crew, YouTubers, Alex, is there any final message you want to share with them? That was a nice little wrap up, but is there anything you want to leave them with about dinosaurs and the dinosaur world before we say farewell? No, just remember, next time you look up into the sky and see a seagull, next time you're having chicken for lunch, you're eating a dinosaur, right? <laughs> Don't forget. Uh, Miss uh, Flynn, Miss Hurley's class, if you guys want to all unmute your microphones, I'm going to bring you in to say a big thank you and farewell with me. Uh, you're in the broadcast. Thank you so much, folks. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you all soon. Can you guys say hello?